for <laughs> who is the president and principal speaker for this very fine ministry. Uh, Pastor, it's good to have you here. It's good to see you, CA. Yeah. It always is. Yeah, even though we have to see you from a distance, uh, it's good to see you. That's all right. That too will pass. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, we, we pray so. Um, we covet your assistance and your participation. <laughs> In this particular, by the grace of God, to answer them from the word, uh, because you need to hear it from the word. You don't need to hear anything of man's devising. We want to give you the truth, Amen. the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And John 17 says, thy word is truth. So we'll try to answer from the word. If an answer can be found, one of us will find it by the grace of God, and we'll bring it to you. You can uh, write us. You can uh, make contact with us by... Uh, uh, writing to or emailing us at tv at some tv dot org tv at some tv dot org and uh, we'll try to take your questions as uh, the Lord gives us time we like studying the word of God and uh, you can assist us by doing precisely that pastor it's another good day and the Lord is good and every day on the top side of the earth is a good day Amen. So we praise the Lord for that. Amen. After the rain comes the sunshine. <laughs> and we've had quite a bit of rain. Amen. <laughs> praise Amen. the Lord. We and of course, it. that's good. Mm -hmm. That is very, very good. Um, you want to take us into our first question? We have some leftover questions, actually, from last time, from last week. And yeah. we can maybe take a look at those. Actually, we have two questions from last week, and we have one question from this week. And I think the one from this week is going to take us quite a long while. I do believe. But let's see how it goes. Mm hmm Okay, here is the question. Can two adults that love each other have sexual relations before marriage? What does the Bible say? Uh, now, I've always known uh, there to be a distinction between adultery, which means that a married person has uh, sexual relations with the wife or husband of another uh, individual, and fornication, mm -hmm. which is having sexual relations uh, before marriage, mm -hmm. uh, you know, single people having sexual relations before marriage. Yes. So the question is, does the Bible address having sexual relations before marriage, does it frown upon something like that? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, a couple of things come, come to mind. Um, one, uh, I'm going to go to a New Testament text um, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. And... Um, you know, sometimes you can look at a question and answer it almost from the reverse side. In other words, all of the relations between men and women that are blessed of the Lord, that have the Lord's sanction, uh, are found within the context of marriage. Um, every time marriage is good, uh, a wife is a good thing to have, the two shall become one, all of those texts uh, give us the idea, the understanding that a blessed sexual relationship is blessed because it is in the confines mm -hmm. uh, of marriage. I'm um, looking here at uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Um, so clear. this kind of, it's, it, it's, Kind of succinct. It, it says marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled so that those activities that are done sexually in the confines of marriage are blessed of the Lord. But fornicators and adulterers will be judged of the Lord. So it, it, it's telling us fairly plainly that God honors sex in marriage right. and sex outside of marriage is a thing for which we will be judged. Yes. And I think we have biblical examples of this. Um, you know, from the very beginning of human history, uh, we find God performing a marriage, and then after that, Adam and Eve have sexual relations. Yes. yes. You know, you have in Genesis chapter 2, mm -hmm. in verse 24, uh, you have the marriage ceremony. And, of course, this is repeated by Jesus in Matthew chapter 19. Um, so it says there in uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, this is the conclusion of the sixth day. Mm -hmm. 
Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. So they have husband and wife. Yes. And they shall become one flesh. And then um, we, in chapter 4 and verse 1, then you have uh, the sexual relations after the marriage ceremony. Yes. It says in chapter 4 and verse 1, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife. Mm -hmm. And the word knew there has to do with having sexual relations. The context shows that. So it says, Now Adam a new Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Yes. Uh, so Cain was her firstborn, so mm -hmm. they had sexual relations after God performed the marriage ceremony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well said. You know, when you look at this, you don't see a blessing of the Lord or even a call of the Lord to have relations with a woman outside of the confines and context of marriage. It just doesn't exist. So we can assume, since it doesn't exist, that um, God does not bless those relations. Only the relations consummated in the context of marriage. You, know, you can think of it this way in sort of an ontological way. Um, you can live with a woman like your sister. You can wash clothes together, cook clean, all those kind of things. The only thing that defines the marriage relationship, what makes it different from any other relationship is the two becoming one. That defines that institution. So if you engage in that kind of activity outside of that, that institution, then you are defrauding what God wanted to be a blessing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's another couple of examples, CA, uh, that uh, we have, you know, practical examples that illustrate the text that you read from Hebrews. Mm -hmm. Because that's a powerful text that you read from Hebrews. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it covers all of the bases. Yeah. But you have the Genesis example. You also have the example from Genesis 34. Ah, uh-huh. It's the story of Shechem. I'm sure you're acquainted with it. Uh, Hamor uh, had a son whose name was Shechem. And Shechem uh, saw Dinah, who was the daughter of, uh, I, of Jacob. Mm -hmm. And he um, said, wow, this is a, this is a beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. And he had sexual relations with her. And obviously that was looked down upon Yes. because in Genesis 34 and verse 7, it says, And the sons of Jacob came from the field when they heard it, that is when they heard that uh, Shechem had sexual relations with uh, Dinah, uh, and the men were grieved and very angry yes. because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. Yes. So very clearly there we find that sex outside of marriage is frowned upon mm -hmm. according to the Hebrew religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well said. Um, Dinah, of course, was the daughter of Jacob with Leah. And um, uh, a lot of drama and trauma grew out of this situation mm -hmm. because the act was the act was illegitimate. It was not blessed by God, not sanctioned by God, and should not have happened. Yeah. And the other example, of course, is very well known. Um, it's the case of Joseph and Mary. Ah, uh, yes. In Matthew chapter 1. Uh, and uh, if you want to read verses 18 and 19, uh, CA, uh, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, once again, we'll see that outside the bond of marriage, um, sexual relations are frowned upon by the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, reading from the New King James. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, uh -huh, before they came together, she was found with child of the, Holy, of the Holy Spirit. And verse 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make a public example, uh, was minded to put her away secretly. So they were betrothed. Basically, that means engaged. Engaged. In the biblical context. So they were not actually married. They were betrothed or they were engaged. Mm -hmm. So clearly, uh, sex before marriage was strongly frowned upon. Yes. According to these verses. Uh, so I think that not only from the Hebrews text, which gives you the principle, but also from these three examples, mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 34, and the story of Mary and Joseph clearly shows that uh, sex is something that uh, takes place after a marriage ceremony. Yes. 
And yeah. I know that's not popular to say these days because no, no. everybody says, well, you know, let's uh, just uh, shack up together and see if it works out. If it doesn't work out, we mm -hmm. don't have a commitment. Yeah. There's very little commitment these days. Right. And, it, of course, it's based on a false premise, that premise being it's my body, I can do what I want with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the Bible is very, very clear that we were created by God to honor God. All of our acts should honor God and be in accordance with God's commandments and God's will. The idea that it's my body, I do what I want, is demonic. It is satanic and does not make us responsible to the God who created us. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, well, I think we covered the bases on that one pretty well. Um, the next one, I'm going to sh throw you a knuckleball. <laughs> you know, they're hard to catch. <laughs> Uh, this question uh, comes up very frequently. Did planet Earth exist before creation week? And if it did, how long did it exist before creation week? Hmm. Well, the Bible begins with the creation of this planet. It picks up the story at the creation of this planet, but it does say that something was here that was without form and void. Something was here in a disorganized state. Now, Colossians lets us know that everything that was made was made by God. So even if something was here disorganized, that something was created by God. Sure. Uh, it's like maybe you put a ball of Play-Doh in the corner and you're going to play with it later. You just leave it there until you're ready to play with it. But something was here that was that was organized by God, and when he began to create, Genesis 1-1, Barashith bara Elohim, when God began to create, that's when the Bible picks up the story. Mm -hmm. But it gives us indication that something was here that was without form and void. Yes. Now what is interesting is that we see that same terminology in the book of Jeremiah. Yes. Jeremiah 4.23, again, the Bible, the, well, let's go to Jeremiah. Yeah. Jeremiah. Um, I think I've got, yeah. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 23. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was, again, without form and void, and the, and the heavens, they had no light. This, of course, is talking about uh, the state of the earth at the end. It will right. return until God comes back to make it all brand new and beautiful. It's going to return to that original, chaotic kind of a state. So we see it at the beginning, and we see it just before God uh, deals with sin completely and, and gives us a new heaven and a new earth. So it gives us the idea that something was here. It was not complete. Certainly it was not formed. It was not as we see it today or even as it was at the end of creation week, but something did exist. Yeah, you know, some people <coughs> say that it's a, a major issue if uh, one says that the planet itself was here, uh, without life mm. before creation week. But I don't see really any problem with that. Agreed. Uh, you know, let me give you an example. Let's suppose that at some point God says, you know, Mars is a planet where there's no life. It can't sustain life. So I'm going to, I'm going to do a six-day creation on Mars. Just this is an example mm -hmm. supposing. Um, would it be a real problem for us that Mars was already there before the week of creation? No, of course not. No, no. The key issue is that uh, the creation took place approximately 6,000 years ago. Yes. The, the created <laughs> order. Mm -hmm. Not whether the planet was here as a mass or whatever it was before that. Yes. But the key is not to believe in long periods of evolution, ruin and con construction, that's reconstruction the idea. There is the key. Uh, so I think that's the key point. Well said, well said. That's the key, that there weren't millions of years. And, and a lot of these things are questions which don't affect our salvation right now. So I'll tell you what, let's do, Pastor. I've got the first year, thousand years, covered with questions. Maybe around two, three thousand years. Mm -hmm. We go to God and we ask him about this one. You know, uh, once we, we've gotten it, but I got a bunch of questions that are at the top of the list before we get to this one. Yeah, but you know, it's one per person. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that's going to take eternity. <laughs> but, but we have eternity, that's the whole point. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, well said, well said. All right, I think we pretty well covered the basis on that one. The third question is um, a new one. Uh, it's not a leftover from last week. And um, 
it's a question that frequently comes up, and that is the principle of the tithe. Is tithing an Old Testament principle that passed away when Jesus died on the cross, or is tithing an enduring principle mm -hmm. that still is um, in play after the death of Christ. In other words, is tithing also a principle that applies to Christians yes. and not only to the Jews? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a good question. Um, in dealing with tithing, I always like to start with some representation, some understanding of who owns this earth and what is our responsibility to that owner. Uh, again, we deal with the mistaken belief by so many, it's mine, the car is mm -hmm. mine, the house is mine. Um, and of course, you miss your car payments or you miss your mortgage payments, you find out who, who, whose it is. Yeah, well. uh, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Very quickly. But you know, when we deal with, the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Correct understanding of tithe has to begin, I, I'm, that was Psalms 24, with an understanding of who this earth belongs to. Um, you know, the, the, the Lakota Indians, when you say Lakota, you're talking about the Sioux, had this idea of stewardship, of managing, it belonged to the great spirit, but it wasn't ours. Um, and then uh, when Europeans came in and others came in, the mindset was a little different. It's mine. It's mine to control. It's mine to manipulate. But that, that old Indian idea that it belongs to God, it belongs, they call it the great spirit, belongs to God. Uh, and we are given stewardship of it. Stewardship mm -hmm. of it. We're given a chance to manage it for him. And all of our dealings with this earth ought to be with respect to who owns it. You've been loaned it for a while. Try to keep it in the best condition that you can. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, uh, I'm just a couple other texts. Psalms chapter 50, uh, begin at verse 10. Every beast mm -hmm. of the field is mine. You know, God claims the gold and the silver is mine. Haggai chapter 2. Uh, the idea that it, it's, it's not yours, and if it is, it is just for a little while. Right. And you are responsible as a steward. So when you, you start with that premise then it's a little easier to move into the fact that there must be a return on God's investment uh, that belongs to him. It is not ours. It is justly claimed by God and belongs to him. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 8. Important verse. Important verse. <laughs> Important verse. Uh, rings, if, rings the bell. If you have anything... It is God who's given you the power to get wealth, to possess it. Yep. So the very strength that you have to get up, that gets us out of our beds every morning, allows us to work, allows us to earn money. That strength comes from God. Right. And uh, we are responsible for, for how we use our bodies and where we put our bodies and what we put in our bodies and what we put on our bodies and how we tax our bodies. And you know this, that there is this long list of responsibilities because God is owner. And again, we are stewards even of our own bodies and our own strength. So you, you kind of set that table. Then you build the stewardship, the tithe aspect on that foundation that God is first and God must be given that which belongs to him. I find it interesting that many of the Sunday preachers, um, they say that the Sabbath is no longer binding. Mm. It's Old Testament. Yes. But when it comes to tithing, <laughs> they say that still applies. Yeah. Because <laughs> tithing know. has to do with their pocketbook. <laughs> and the Sabbath maybe that, not. That's well right. said. Uh, <laughs> but do we have any New Testament uh, evidence that the tithe is still a binding principle. Uh, you know, you, you gave the principle mm -hmm. of God being the owner and us being stewards. Uh, you know, most of the, the texts that speak about tithing are found in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament. You know, and it's, by the way, it's not uh, given to the Jews first because Abraham tithed, Jacob tithed. Jacob tithed all before uh, the Jewish nation Long existed. before the Jewish nation was established. Precisely. Uh, but, but do we have New Testament evidence that the tithing is still a binding principle? Indeed we do. S since you rarely ask a question that you do not know the answer to, I'm going to let you handle that one. 
<laughs> no, you're, you're a slippery guy. <laughs> yeah, the, a couple of verses come to mind. Uh, one of them is Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23. Well done. Matthew 23, and I know that you knew this one. You're just acting like you didn't. Um, <laughs> I have Matthew, to have it written here. Matthew 23, 23. I'm sure you had it in your notes. Uh, Matthew 23. Here, these are the woes on the scribes and the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they were very careful tithers, which is not a bad thing, by the way. Yep. Uh, but uh, it all has to do with motivation. It says in verse 23, Woe to you, mm -hmm. scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise mm -hmm. and cumin. Yes. Those were uh, seeds, mm -hmm. mainly, uh, small ones. And have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. Mm -hmm. In other words, they were tithing, but they did not have justice, mercy, and faith. Yes. Now, what does Jesus say? Does Jesus say, don't tithe then? No. What does he say? Matthew 23, 23. And cumin, let me pick it up. 24, blind guides who strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. This ought ye to have done. Let me back up. This ought ye to have done. These ought ye to have done <clears throat> without leaving the other undone okay so so what is he saying so he, he's saying you're doing right by doing those things but you haven't done enough you haven't completed the law you you ought to do those things but you ought to do this also you ought to, to pay your tithes to do these nice things is a good thing but be honest in your dealings with god uh this ought you to have done and not to leave the other done in other words do it all not either or but both and but both correct correct Okay, the second place, and this is even more important, because the tithe in the Old Testament was used to remunerate the priesthood, mm -hmm. the spiritual leaders. Yes. This one is uh, found in 1 Corinthians 9. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And, um, you know, Paul was being criticized because, um, you know, he... Um, because he was okay with uh, his workers taking their tie, their wives with them on trips. <laughs> and so the Apostle Paul has an answer uh, to that particular uh, conundrum that uh, uh, those uh, individuals have put him in. And so uh, in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians and verse 13, uh, the Apostle Paul is going to uh, give a very important argument, but let's go a little bit earlier uh, to chapter 9, and uh, actually let's read uh, beginning of verse 1. Verse 1. Am I not context. Okay, N am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not, are you not my works in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. That is the Corinthians. Mm -hmm. Okay, continue. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles? the brothers of the Lord and Cephas. In other words, why don't we have the right to yeah. take a wife with us on our trips? Yeah, it's a rhetorical okay. argument, really, that he's right. making here. Continue verse 6. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right uh, to, re to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock. He gives three Strong illustrations. Argument. No one goes to war and has to pay for his own expenses. No one plants a vineyard and can't eat its fruit. No one can um, tend a flock and not drink of the milk of the flock. Mm. But now let's continue in verse 8. Do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. If is it oxen God is concerned about? So let's just stop right there. Mm -hmm. so, so the oxen, when they were, uh, according to this, treading the grain, they could eat of the grain. Yes. Because they were working. Mm -hmm. 
So the Apostle Paul is using the illustration of the, of the oxen, and he's saying God gave that uh, prescription in the Old Testament not only for the good of the oxen, but also to teach us a lesson. <laughs> so let's continue at verse 10. Verse 10. Or does he say, if altogether for our sakes, for our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partakers of his hope. Uh, continue. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap our material things? Your material things. I'm sorry, reap your material things. If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Okay, and then comes the last example. He's used the example of the ox, the example of eating from the vineyard, mm -hmm. the example, you know, several examples mm -hmm. that if you work, you should be able to eat. And then comes the biggest example, verse 13 and 14. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple? Yes. In other words, the tithe <coughs> that people brought. And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Speaking about the Levites mm -hmm. and the priests. Verse 14, even so, that means in the same way as in the old system, even so the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should, should live, live from, the gospel. from the gospel. So uh, <clears throat> so what he's saying is that those who preach the gospel should live from the tithe. Yes. As the priests and the Levites in the old system and mm -hmm. live from the tithe. Mm -hmm. So this is a clear um, repetition of the tithing principle yes. in the New Testament that the tithe should go to remunerate those who are preaching the gospel. Yes, 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 and amen. Um, uh, in Leviticus, in Numbers, in Malachi, the system is established that God leaves the tithe or separates the tithes for those who work for the Lord. Amen. And Paul simply reaffirms that in the New Testament, and he's got Many, many texts in the Old Testament on which to base his argument. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, time's up. Do you want to say a few words to finish? <laughs> <laughs> Time goes so fast when you're Amen. having fun. And really digging into the Word of God and finding the truths uh, therein is, is fun and is uh, a great way to spend your time. Again, TV at some TV, uh, 